I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Ballara and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Today I'm here with Kevin Bupp. Kevin is a Florida-based real estate investor, a top iTunes podcast host and a best-selling author with over $250 million in real estate transactions. Uh, his investment experience spans the gamut of apartment buildings, single family portfolio, medical office, self storage, assisted living, um, and also mobile home parks, parking lots, and build to rent communities. So, um, first of all, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, Jason, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. And I am uh, your, your sort of bio says, favorite and most profitable. I, I'm actually, we've talked mobile home parks, but um, not really parking lots or, or build to rent communities. So I think uh, there'll be some really interesting things to talk about that that are at least unique thus far in, in my uh, guests. So that's awesome. Sure. Um, would you do us a favor and just kind of start telling us your background, what kind of brought you to real estate? Mm -hmm. um, you, you've got a lot of, a long list of accomplishments, but uh you must have started somewhere. So let's, <laughs> let's go with that first. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll do it again. Thanks for having me here. And um, you know, I'll try to keep this somewhat condensed. So I, I'm 43 as of, uh, as of this recording. And uh, I've been a full-time real estate investor my, my entire adult life. You know, I, I always like to joke and say that real estate kind of found me. I, I didn't really find it. And, you know, back when I was 19, I, I, you know, graduated high school, went to local community college because I really didn't know what I wanted to do with life. I was just going through the motions attending bar in the evening uh, to, to kind of pay my way. And, and again, you know, whatever path that was going to lead me, I didn't know at that present time. But ultimately, I, I met a, a gentleman by the name of David. David was a local real estate investor in, uh, um, in, in the area where I grew up, which was in Pennsylvania. And, you know, just a couple of things that really struck me about David and his presence and just, you know, how he, you know, how he dressed, what he drove, his flexibility in his daily schedule, his daily life was just it was kind of foreign to me. Uh, I grew up with two great parents, both working uh, parents, uh, you know, working household, uh, sometimes having to work opposite shifts. You know, my mom would work like, you know, the the graveyard shift uh, so that we didn't have to get a sitter. And, you know, ultimately just sure. they, they kind of did what they had to do. But it was all relative growing up. Like we had what we needed and uh, we had a roof over our head and we had a family vacation every year, things like that. But, um, you know, to me, adults at that age are supposed to be working nine to fives like that's just that's yeah. kind of how we were born and bred. And uh, David was not that way at all. Dave was very entrepreneurial, um, you know, just uh, had a lot of flexibility in his daily schedule. And that was, um, th that was just, uh, it caught me by surprise. And, and ultimately, long story short, I, I, Dave and I became friends. Uh, we became friends and I got to know what it is he did. I didn't really understand it, couldn't comprehend it, but, you know, I, I was intrigued enough to uh, just really open up a dialogue with him. And, and what, what occurred out of that friendship is within a couple of months of knowing him, he invited me to a conference. Uh, 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 it was a Ron Legrand conference down in Philadelphia. Ron Legrand, I think he's still around teaching nowadays, uh, but it was a you know fix and flip wholesale conference and his, David's business partner couldn't attend, so I went with him. And as a result of that three-day boot camp, I came back excited, um, but not necessarily knowing to where you know, where to put that excitement, how to actually put it into action. And so I, I, you know, made David an offer that I would basically work with him, and work for free. You know, work for free, do whatever he needed um, uh, help with. He was kind of a solopreneur, you know, um, you know kind of doing his own thing. And uh, he was about 25 years old and I, so I knew technology wasn't a strong suit of his. And that's where they, I, I helped with a little bit of everything. But a lot of times I would help facilitate PowerPoint presentations that he would use for his private lenders, you know, when he was buying a new project and things like that. And so I just, through osmosis and just being around him for about a year and a half, I learned a lot about his business and and decided when I was, uh, you know, my mid twenties, I decided I was going to buy my first property with seven grand that I'd saved up bar, uh, bartending. And that was the start of it. So that was literally the that was the foundational pivotal moment in my life where I, I finally like took the leap, bought my first piece of real estate, and then very quickly learned that David's business model wasn't the best fit for me given that point in time. And so uh, over time, I slowly evolved my model. And I would wholesale a number of homes, keep one, wholesale a number of homes, keep one. But the whole objective for me was 
to generate cash flow, a positive cash flow from these rental properties. That was his model. His model was buy and hold. And he had been at it a lot longer than I. He had more capital, disposable income. He had more capital to work with. He had private lenders. I didn't have that. And so I, once I used my $7,000, I realized it was going to take a long time to actually save up enough money to buy that next property. So fast forward, you know, in my early 20s, I, I was able to uh, build up a fairly large portfolio of single family rental properties, over 100, about 125 leading into 2008. And, um, you know, got introduced uh, back in like 2005 to multifamily properties, started buying some smaller multifamily. And then realized that there was a lot of efficiencies of scale with commercial property, not just multifamily, but just commercial properties in general. And that um, you, bigger deals seemingly were a lot of times easier than that of just buying one single family home at a time. And so that really projected me to kind of where we're at today and really what we've been doing for, I guess, the last 12, 13 years, which is buying commercial assets. And, and you know, more specifically, as it relates to this conversation, for the past uh, 10 years, we've been solely focused on mobile home parks. And then about four years ago, started buying parking assets. So parking garages and parking lots in very targeted specific markets. So, but I've owned everything in between. I've owned, uh, and I still own today, medical office, self-storage, some retail, um, assisted living and a litany of other things. And so it's, uh, but it's well-versed amongst the commercial field. And, and I, the only residential property I own at present time is the single family home that I live in today. That's great. And I mean, I think a lot of actually good, lessons i guess you can call them you know sort of that beginning period we, a couple of things you said one <laughs> and i think it just struck me because i feel like this is I, I mean i definitely thought this too but you know you see people that are out and about in the daytime and you're like oh they must not have a job and it's like <laughs> <laughs> no no like this is this is actually what you know many entrepreneurs are striving for that's the whole point is that yeah. time freedom so it's kind of it's funny that that in a lot of people think that it's like oh these people that are out in the in the nine to five hours they must not have a job it's like no they might have the best job or they might already be <laughs> you know sort of independently wealthy so it, it's a it's a de definitely an interesting mindset shift and to have you know, meet someone that that ultimately be, became your mentor is seeing that and seeing what's possible. Um, I think is is very, especially at a young age, like that's very a very good impression to take forward. And then we talk a lot. A lot of guests we talk about, you know, sort of that mentorship model. And and a lot of now it's like, okay, you know, I I paid to be in this this group or whatever, but also it's important to remember there's this, you know, sort of apprenticeship model or, you know, organic mentorship where if you have that ability to go and just say, okay, I'm just going to go find someone to work for them. Like you're probably going to get better if not, you know, equal mentorship to, to being in one of the programs. So I think um, it's, it's probably less used now, but important for people to know that those, those opportunities exist. And it could be a combination of the two, right? right? I think it might be a little easier. It might be the the faster track just to pay someone uh, for the mentorship program that might already have structure and be in place. But, right. um, you know, I would say that I agree with you that I think there's a lot more value more than likely that you would probably find by finding an organization to work for and, and finding your way into that organization that, that's doing what you might want to do, right, in, yeah. in the real estate world or whatever it is that you want to achieve. And, uh, and and being really firsthand in within the organization, but that that might be a little more challenge challenging, given that you got to find an open position and to be the right fit for it. But right. um, maybe a dual dual approach would be the best way. Yeah, no, I think that I actually like that idea a lot. It's, you know, you have some some level of of structured mentorship, but then and maybe if it's maybe it's through that mentorship program where you meet right. you know some people and you're you're kind of really getting in there at, at a at a you know, sort of deeper level about how they run their business. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think it's cool. Um, well, what made you, you know, kind of sounds like, I, I think we talk a lot about, you know, the progression from single family to multifamily and, and commercial and why that's pe oftentimes people go in that direction. But interestingly, what, what made you then go towards, you know, parking and uh, parking structures? What, what shifted in your, in your, I guess, business model there. Yeah. And, and I wouldn't say anything that sh any, no, nothing necessarily shifted. I would say that uh, we've always tried to take the contrarian approach to investing and, and find assets that aren't, aren't overly exploited or asset classes that aren't overly exploited. And, you know, 10 years ago when I, when I, and that's actually been, it's been about 11 years since I bought my, when I bought my first mobile home park, 
that was a very under the radar asset class. Uh, mm -hmm. Institutions, you know, had no interest in it whatsoever. Um, there were just a handful of publicly traded companies, but th those larger players held less than you know five percent of the overall manufactured houses throughout the housing communities throughout the United States. And so it was a very mom and poppy fragmented niche that uh, to me represented a ton of opportunity. And so that has since changed. I mean, it's it's it's. Um, it's in a race towards consolidation. I'll, I'll leave it at that. It's uh, it's a very different world today in that business model than what it was 10 years ago. And, you know, I'm always, we're always on the, always on the lookout for that next opportunity, that, that, that under the radar opportunity that that's there in front of our face that we might not have considered historically. And, you know, as a result of an inter interview I did probably five years ago on my podcast, I interviewed a gentleman. I love niches. I love finding those niche niches and uh, just really um, pulling back the curtain and understanding the business model. And parking was one of them. I interviewed a guy and um, I never even considered parking as an investment. Obviously, somebody owns them, right? Someone owns these parking right. lots of parking garages across the country. And after an hour long conversation, I was intrigued enough to to take a deeper dive. And so it took a couple of years for us to really um, fully understand and comprehend the business model. But what we real, realized is that there was a lot of similarities to that in mobile home parks. It was it's, it's a very fragmented mom and poppy niche. It's not consolidated at all. There's a very small contingent of institutional investors in the space, and they're not making any more parking, right? It's it's a diminishing asset class. A lot of surface lots are being redeveloped across this country. And so for us, finding it in a um, strategic market, a market that that's growing, it's got a, a growth trajectory, but being able to still make sense of that parking asset as a cash flow covered land plate to where we can actually hit our returns a day um, as it's operating as a parking lot, we know that that is inevitably the, the lowest value that it will ever have because at some point in time in the future, it will have a higher and better use, assuming that we're buying in the right location um, and in a growth marketplace that we can just operate as parking, which is very simple. Um, and again, parking is diminishing, uh, you know, throughout every major market across the country. In fact, a lot of municipalities are actually re removing the, um, parking requirements for new, new developments. And so it, it's being constrained at a very, very fast pace. And so I know that I can make money, get a return for our investors with a cash flow and covered land play and know that in, it will ultimately be a higher and better use at some point in the future. So I love that asset class. I love the mom and poppy nature to it. Again, very similar in nature to that of, of, uh, of, of mobile home parks and uh, what we saw with mobile home parks. And yet it is not exploited. In fact, I have yet other than going to parking conferences, I have yet to meet other investors just through, you know, different mastermind groups I'm a part of or different um, investment clubs. I have yet to meet another investor that actually owns a parking facility. So it is, um, it's a very below the radar asset class. That's, that's why we like it. Again, just very contrarian in nature. Yeah. And I mean, that makes total sense that to, to go with those asset classes that are, you know, not everybody's doing right. There's less competition. You've got you're you're essentially leading that market instead of just trying to kind of play catch up all the time. What uh, you said there are there there are actual parking conferences like that that there even, are <laughs> even even that make it yeah. just it doesn't like you well, like you said at first you didn't think of parking as a an asset class. Yeah, and the, and the reason why is that obviously there's 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 um, hundreds of of local, regional, national parking operators. They, they don't necessarily own the real estate. In fact, most of them do not own the underlying real estate, but these are management companies. I mean, that that is, you know, for the most part, that is the business model. Um, and that, that was the other intriguing part to me is as we kind of dug a little deeper, you know, there's multiple publicly traded um, parking companies. One's uh, SP Plus or Laz Parking. Those are two big ones. SP Plus is a publicly traded company. I think they're the largest uh, in, the, in the world, and but they don't own any real estate. So there's these massive organizations but they're just on the operational side. And what I found is that the underlying ownership structure is mostly that of mom and pops. I mean, someone that owns one, maybe parking asset, maybe two or three, but it's, these aren't large conglomerates that have billions of dollars of parking assets, uh, you know, within their portfolio. And so to me, that, that was another part of the opportunity that we recognize there is that, um, w w you know, in the, in the mobile home park space, we have an entirely vertically integrated infrastructure. And so we have the property management and acquisitions. Everything is in-house. It's all underneath one umbrella. And property management's not sexy. It's a necessary evil of the business. Um, it's, not a pro it's not a profit center for us whatsoever. It's, you know, we almost view it as a break even. Um, but it's a necessary evil. It's very staff, staff intensive. Um, there's lots of moving parts to it. And so uh, being that parking, again, it's had a very fragmented nature on the ownership side of things. 
but a very, very professional uh, front side. So the property management operation side, there's hundreds of operators across the country that we have the opportunity of partnering with or working with um, to run these assets to where we don't have to build out another vertically integrated property management infrastructure. So that was very attractive is that we could find undervalue or undermanaged assets and then find, you know, have no less than three, four, five, six professional operators that could we could put an RFP to a request for a proposal and you know find the most competitive bid of who's going to manage this parking asset for us without us having to actually do it in-house and so that was very attractive and so why why these parking associations exist long story short is that they got all these operators across the country that run these lots for not just private individuals but also municipalities and so they keep up with technology you know the latest and greatest trends in the parking world and things of that nature but there's a couple of huge ones uh we, you know we were just recently at one and there was I don't know, 3,000, 4,000 attendees. I mean, fairly substantial in size. Uh, I mean, that's fascinating. And it, <laughs> I too think that I, I am, you know, definitely very interested in that sort of the contrary assets that people are investing in and, and finding finding success. Cause I think that's, you know, everything, a lot of things by the time you know a lot about it, it's because everybody's doing it. And so sure. at that point, you're just, you know, kind of, trying to stay stay play catch up i guess um no it's, it's very fascinating so so you're not managing them you're using these these professional management companies and where do you find them i mean if you're looking for is this like a go direct to owner how how do you locate these yeah that that's a great question and that that's been one of our strong suits uh ever since i started buying you know single family homes back in the day i've i've carried over a lot of the a lot of the strategies that that I found success in back then, just buying individual properties over to commercial real estate. And so, um, you know, 95% of the portfolio that we own today, both in mobile home parks and in parking have been a direct result of, of a, a database that we've created over many, many years. We've got a team that keeps it updated and we've got a team that just like a, a good brokerage firm would do on your behalf, but literally picks up the phone and, 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 you know, opens up a dialogue with an owner of a property. You know? and, and so it's a very targeted approach. We go direct to owner, we document these conversations um, in a CRM system, and and you know some of these deals take a few months, some of them take a few years. We got a deal I just put under contract the other day that literally I've been talking to that guy for seven years, and we finally just got it tied up. Um, it, the timing was finally right, and so um, we've had great wow. success with that model. You know, and and I'd say a lot of the success has also uh, come from the the relations that the relationship that we're able to build. Again, a lot of these sellers are generational owners; they've owned it for you know, 10, 15, 20 years, some of them have emotional attachments to the property. You know, speaking to the the individual that we just tied up their mobile home park not too long ago, literally he's owned a park for 42 or 43 years. He has literally raised his entire family as a result of the income of this community. Like he literally built the second and third phase. He took it from a, you know, 20 space park to a, now it's a 130 space park. He, he did the second and third phases himself back when he was in his forties. Um, you know, he's, he's, you know, roughly 80 today. They've owned it for that many years. It's literally put their kids through school. I mean, it's, it's put them, you know, on vacations. I mean, it's paid for their, their lifestyle. And so he's not just looking for the highest and best dollar amount for that property, but he also wants someone to kind of, to him, it's a legacy, like to him, like someone's going to step in there. He's been an integral part of that town that they're in. Um, you know, they've got a great reputation. He, he, he wants, he wants dollar, he wants the highest dollar, uh, highest uh, value for that property, but he also wants the, the right operator to come and actually take that over. And so we found, you know, the direct owner approach very valuable in that sense and that we can, we can probably out, you know, win out a bid on a property and maybe not be the highest bidder on it, the highest dollar amount, but ultimately mm -hmm. that relationship had, you know, allowed us to carry it through to the end and, and be the one that gets awarded the opportunity. So um, that's how we find the parking as well. Do the same thing. Um, uh, you know, uh, there's lots of opportunity out there. I think in any asset class to kind of take that approach, although it, it could be a, a little bit more time extensive approach, but I think if you, if you're playing that long game, which is what we do, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it, it pays multiples in the long run. So uh, don't know yeah. if that, that, that was a long winded answer to, to your question, but uh, direct to owner uh, off market is how we buy these. <laughs> no, that's, I mean, that's great. I, and I think that the, the demonstrating that you were, you know, sort of talking to this owner for seven years is that's just a, people, a lot of people don't do direct to owner. It's a lot of work, right? It's a lot of, yeah. you know, persistence and stuff. A lot of people don't do it, but, but, the success that you can have with that is, is I think huge. And I think, but, but you have to be prepared to do what you're doing 
and that you're, you know, doing that follow up and all of that. There's another part of that story I think I, I want to share. I think it's relevant to where we're at in today's time with capital markets, with interest rates, where they're going. I mean, interest rates right now, I mean, have are killing a lot of deals and we sell our expectations aren't necessarily adjusting as fast as maybe the, uh, the debt markets are adjusting. And, right. and so there's a dichotomy there and that, um, you know, deals are ultimately falling apart because, you know, they're not able to hit our target returns for, you know, buying an opportunity. We need to make sure that we, you know, ultimately can service our investors and, um, you know, get the, you know, hit, hit our target returns that we set out for. And so with this scenario, um, this relationship that we built, this, uh, you know, if we had inked this thing six months ago, it wouldn't even have come into the conversation. Um, as far as you know, we had already a dollar amount agreed upon a long time ago, but he was just for whatever reason, it wasn't his time yet. And when it finally was his time, guess what? No longer were interest rates at four percent, they're at six and a half percent, right? And and explain to him how that you know massively cha changes the deal, the economics of the deal. Um, he understood and found himself in a, in a, in a, in a kind of a dilemma of like, well, now I feel like I don't have an exit out of this property, right? I waited all this time, had it for this many years. I don't want to hold it for another 10 years to go through another cycle. And so, you know, we were able to structure some very attractive owner financing terms, owner financing terms that are even better than that of what the rates were six, you know, six months ago. And I don't mm -hmm. think that that we would have been able to get as good of terms as we actually got, unless we had that relationship with him. And so, um, I mean, we got terms that were probably, you know, akin to that of probably a year, year and a half ago, what you would have got with Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, you know, agency debt terms with a long period of interest only. So um, I think a lot of that was a direct result of the relationship that we, that we built over the number of years. And so I just, I think there's a lot of value there. And I think there's, I think we're in that point in time and opportunity in, in, in the space where there's an opportunity for folks that are listening. If you're working on deals that, going the extra step and it doesn't mean seven years, right? Like, but just going that extra step a little bit um, to, to, to build a little bit more of a bond with a seller, you might find yourself in a scenario where you can structure some good seller financing terms. I've actually seen more seller financing terms over the past like month than I've seen over the past like eight years. I mean, just yeah. even broker listings coming through. One of the bullet points is, you know, potential owner financing that has not happened for a very long time. And I think that represents an opportunity for, for those investors that are looking for deals nowadays. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, I think, and probably seven years is an extreme example, but <laughs> it but is, the, it is. But the reality is, is that it's, you're not likely to walk in day one, you know, first time you talk to a seller and, and <laughs> lock up the deal and then they're going to finance it for you. Like that's, right. that's not generally what's going to happen, but, but what you're doing and building these relationships and being consistent and all of that is is a perfect you know kind of example and lesson for people to learn in terms of how, you know that this is because of what's happening in the debt market like this is the way to keep doing deals and get you know some attractive finance in that way um let's talk a little bit about build to rent or your uh are you doing development as well what's your kind of stance on that we are, we are. And so that, that is a, um, uh, that, that's a new, uh, project for us, or I guess a new part of our, of our business model, you know, and it's really mobile home parks are multifamily housing, right? It's residential right. housing. It's just a different variation of that. And so, um, you know, the build to rent space, uh, it was very attractive to us in that number one, we, we can all agree that there's a massive demand for affordable housing in this country. I mean, it's, and we've got a massive shortage of it as well. And so, um, you know, for the past year or so, there's been, you know, labor, labor prices have been skewed, material prices have been skewed. And then also that that's really trickled down. Um, as far as the demand for multifamily housing, that's really trickled down to even BC grade properties to where um, there's a period of time and it, it even exists to a certain extent today to where um, you ultimately would be able to buy for not too much more of a, uh, of a, uh, shift in cap rate, a class A brand new property than that of a, of a BC property. And so, you know, as we start looking at the economics of even, you know, just traditional multifamily from that sense, we realized that the development model, while there is some inherent risk with development, that ultimately you, you absolutely um, step in with a, a better equity, you know, sweat equity standpoint with a development deal if you're willing to take the front end risk than that of even buying an existing product. And so, in addition to that, you've got a brand new product that's got brand new mechanicals, um, and uh, and and ultimately, it's something that probably isn't going to have that much to you know maintenance or upkeep for a number of, of years um, after after it comes out of the ground. And so, but that's a big part of it. And then the other big part of it is just the the massive shift of of you know the 
you know, the, the Gen Z's and the millennials, millennials under household formation years. I mean, they're, they're really shifting to a, uh, you know, to a renter by choice model. There, there's a contingent that are shifting to a renter by choice model, which again, um, everyone's got their different flavor, what type of rental housing they want. We've seen just a massive uh, positive trend in the built to rent space, more so the single family type dwelling space than that of a traditional mm-hmm. multifamily. You know, there's a good fit for everybody out there. Um, but these millennials that are forming these these households that are, you know, having kids and you know, having their first girl or boy and, and you know, raising families are really attracted to this, this build to rent, you know, subdivision type of model. And so, um, you know, and, and, and that contingent is fairly large of, of, of the of the of the millennial crowd. And so we're just looking to service that and ultimately really like the fact that it's a brand new product coming out of the ground and that again, it's something that we know the history of because we we built it and um and more than likely will not have maintenance type challenges that you have with a vintage 70s or 80s property um for quite some time to come. So it's just a it's an attractive space for us. It's a it's a new area that we're super excited about. And again, um, speaking to some of the data points, uh, it was a, a, a group I, I saw a study from a couple of weeks back that if all the major builders in the country, so like the KB homes of the world, like the big the big dogs, mm-hmm. if they literally doubled down today for the next ten years with their production, they still wouldn't meet or be able to fill the demand that exists for housing at present time. So. That's um, that's a shocking data point, and yeah. and it's ultimately one that we would like to help fulfill by building high quality, you know, built to rent product in some you know very strategic markets across the country. So we're super excited about it. Um, you know, mobile home parks have been we're, we're incredibly excited about mobile home parks still. Unfortunately, mobile home parks there's not no new supply coming on the marketplace. In fact, it's if anything, it's got a it's one of the few asset classes that have a diminishing supply. So there's we've got this massive demand for it but there's no new supply coming into the marketplace for a litany of reasons and a number of communities that every year get redeveloped into higher and better uses, yeah. whether they're in the path of progress or whatever. And so the development model allows us to continue growing our portfolio and products that we believe in and markets that we believe in. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I think, yeah, the, the point about mobile home, you know, it the land that those mobile home parks on in, in certainly in certain markets, it's just going to be more valuable using it yeah. some other way than keeping it as a mobile home park. So that's, yeah, well, a lot of the, a lot of them were built 50, 60, sometimes 70 years ago. And so yeah. while back then they were probably on the outskirts of town, they were probably in the less desirable, maybe industrial area of town. Um, obviously those towns have grown and yeah. you know, now you find some of these communities that are literally, they are, in, they're not coming, they're not into the path of progress. They're actually progress is already around it and it's past it. And there's ultimately a higher and better use for that land. Yeah. Yeah. Makes total sense. What do you, what do you mean by what's your definition of cash flow investor? Because we have, I've had a lot of, and we've talked about this a lot. And, and I think it's something very uh, important for people to know what their investment criteria are are in the sense that what do you what do you want to get out of your investments so so how would you define that for people in in terms of you know obviously it's your book but but what do you what do you sort of put out there that that that's how you would define it yeah i mean i think making investments in real estate that ultimately allow you to you know that they'll create that provide the 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 income or the cash flow that allow you to live whatever lifestyle it is you so choose to live right for me you know, being a cash flow investor, like the, mo- the most important thing to me, I guess you could say my why is it's my family, right? And, and I've got uh, six and nine year olds. So I've got young kids. Um, I enjoy more than anything else spending a ton of time with them, not just like on vacations or just the weekends, but taking them to school in the morning, picking them up, taking them to sports yeah. games, practices, whatever that means. Uh, we love spending time together as a family and, 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 you know, making investments that give you the time and flexibility to to do those things. I mean that that to me is a is a true definition of a cash flow investor. So it might mean something different for for other folks, but for me that that is the importance of the investments that we make, the properties that we buy, the passive investments that I make on the personal on a personal side of things is that it ultimately I want to buy time. Yeah. I want to buy time with my money and I want that 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 investment to actually provide me more flexibility in my yeah oh. you there yeah sorry. sorry i think that's my uh for some reason it's got a internet unstable notification sorry about that but but yeah i i think you're um you know kind of 
the the idea behind that so here here's my and it, i'm not i don't even want i'm not trying to be contrary or anything i honestly this is a question that i you know a lot of people say invest for cash flow invest for cash flow invest for mm -hmm. cash flow but unless you have a lot of money already to invest mm -hmm. i think that's a hard thing to do like like you've been doing it a long time you've got to the the point where yes you probably could you know have enough invested that your the cash flow off those investments you can live off of but when when we're, when i'm talking to someone you know we've got a multifamily offering i'm talking to them and they're like you know we're going to put in $50,000 at this point you know 8% cash flow in multifamily is is pretty good and so yeah. they're going to get $4,000 a year like that's not necessarily going to set them up and have that freedom that they're looking for so mm -hmm. wh what's your what's your take on that and i know you know yeah. There's a lot of things that go into it. It's time in the market and all of that. But but what do you, how would you sort of suggest people structure that approach? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. I mean, obviously everyone's got their own individual goals and speaking to that person that, that has $50,000 to invest. I, I don't know what that individual's goals are. Like what, how much do they have to make on a monthly basis to achieve whatever they want to achieve? Is it quitting their daytime job? Is it, you know, go to travel the world? I, I don't know the answer to that. Like we each have our own individual answers to that question. And if their, if their answer to that is like, they want to, you know, make $300,000 a year of truly passive income from their investments. Well, um, it's going to be very hard to do. It's going to be very hard to achieve that. If, if all they can invest is $50,000, you know, once every year, right. From right. whatever job that they're, that, that they're working. And so, Again, that, whatever their answer is to that question, whatever you know that, that target goal is on a on a monthly reoccurring basis, uh, it's going to be different for each. But um, you know, if it is a, if they are like got this dream of this higher level and they want to get there in five or ten years in a fairly short period of time, then I think they've got to figure out an active way um, to actually generate more income. Um, whether that's you know go get your MBA to get a higher level, higher paid level position within the company that you're in, you know, start a, a business. Um, you know, if you want to stay within real estate, I, I love telling folks like start, I, I know some incredibly successful uh, guys that, that, that have wholesaling organizations that literally they, you know, they, they wholesale 40, 50, 60 homes a year and, you know, generate, you know, true net in their pocket, you know, anywhere between half a million to a million dollars of, of net proceeds, highly taxable net proceeds, but still right. a lot of, a lot of cash and a lot of money to work with. That's still within the realm of real estate. So they're already, they're in it. They're kind of swimming around in it already, but they take those proceeds and then ultimately put it into passive investment. So they've got an active business that's actually generating a substantial amount of income, which allows them to actually parlay that into passive investments that you and I offer that allows them to continually compound compound the, their efforts right and and, and yeah. it takes a lot of time of compounding um uh if you've only got fifty thousand dollars once a year so you got i think he's got to figure out a way to invest more i i, yeah. I don't know the better answer to that question because i you know, unless unless you know there's just some opportunities out there that offer you just out of this world returns which again um uh, there's probably more risk associated with those but i mean just speaking to conservative investments that you and i offer um, it would take that with well, that person quite quite a long time if that's all they could do. So they got to figure out a better way on the front end to generate more income that they could then in turn invest into passive deals. Yeah, yeah, and I, I mean I agree totally that that's you know you you've got to one you've got to get committed to it. You've got to say that this is yeah. you know I'm I'm going to use investing to get myself ahead, and then you do have to figure out a way to get more money invested. And so that's why I. I my personal thought on it is, you know, if you're early in the game, maybe you're looking more at what are the deals that I can get better equity multiples rather than, and, and it depends on the asset class and the and the market and all that. But, you know, I think mobile home parks, although as you mentioned now, you know, it it's starting to, I think it, it's become more mainstream. But I know traditionally those were a higher cash flowing asset. But I would imagine on your like your build to rent projects is virtually no cash flow while it's being built. That's correct. And so you're so but I but my understanding of any sort of uh development type deals is that you know you're looking at because you're not getting high cash flow in the beginning or, or any cash flow in the beginning, those are maybe higher equity multiples. That's correct. And so so yeah, maybe there's a little more risk, but that that's where my whole point is just that people need yeah. to look at what their strategy and goals are and yes. and use the appropriate investment vehicle for that. That, that's correct. Yeah. No, I mean, to, to think that, 
to think that again, uh, it, it, it truly does take money to make money when we're talking about yeah. like actually passive investments, right? You've got to have the actual physical right. cash to invest in something in order to, to grow your wealth. And so you got to figure out a way to either start with a, you know, a, a bigger nut or, Ultimately, I don't think there's really an answer of how to, you know, turn that fifty thousand into five hundred thousand in a very short period of time, right, right? right? At least not with the type of investments that we're that we're speaking to. And then even then, when you speak to these traditional investments, uh, you know, let's use multifamily or mobile home parks, either one as an example. Um, you know, even even finding opportunities out there that have that, you know, that two x multiple. Um, you're probably talking. It, it, Maybe years past, it was like, okay, the goal was three to five years, and they did in 18 months just because the market was so crazy, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I think those times, they're not long gone, but like one surely cannot set their expectations on that. Um, and so most of these traditional deals are three to five years. So let's use three years as the marker. Um, that's a long time. It really is. If, if, you're, if you've got these grander visions of like uh, whatever that is for you, you know, $100,000 a month passive income or, you know, having a big yacht, I don't know, wh whatever that might be, it's right. going to take a long time to get there unless you can figure out a way to invest more capital and allow it to work on your behalf. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. And I, I think it's just uh, use it, really understanding what whatever investment you're getting into understanding mm -hmm. what the expectation should be there and and that's so it's it's always um I, I i kind of like that sort of topic there in just that people really need to understand what exactly they are trying to get out of it and that yeah you're not you're not going to turn fifty thousand dollars into five hundred thousand dollars anytime soon unless you're sort of aggressively adding to that invested amount. And that, and that's like per, my personal philosophy is I want to increase my equity as fast as I can so that in five or 10 years, now I do have enough that I can yes. have a lot of that be, be, and whether that's equity through, you know, like you said, generating more income and getting that invested or just having higher growth investments and it is all projections anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you just, that's you just right. need to know what you're, what you're looking at. Um, that's right. And, and, and just one more point there. I mean, so we're, we're really speaking to one of two buckets, right? Like that's kind of like the growth bucket where like they're, they're still trying to make the wealth. Right. But then ultimately we've got another contingent of our investor base. Like they're, they're in a completely separate bucket. They're in a yeah. preservation stage, right? Like yeah. they've made it now. It's just, you know, finding a ways not to lose it and uh, just, you know, more, more slow growth than anything else. They don't need to necessarily get, you know, two and, you know, two and a half X multiples on their, on their capital, although they'd be happy to, but either way, like they're, they're, they're okay with much more conservative, um, you know, low equity multiple investments and just make, want to make sure that the money they start with is there and that it grows over time, but ultimately they don't necessarily need to double and triple it in a very short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it, it I, I love that point. It's a, it, what, whatever phase you are in your investing journey is, is what, you know, and it, people talk about that a lot from a stock market standpoint as to when do you want to be aggressive and when do you want to get conservative? But I don't know that, I don't feel like I hear a lot of people talk about it in the real estate space. It's like, oh, I invest for cash flow or I invest for the tax, but it, like, but it's, it all, it's, they, they're not, independent entities like it all goes together and so figuring out how that works for you is is really important um that's that's very cool kevin let, let's switch gears so i can ask you the questions that i like to ask every guest and you you sort of already touched on this but uh, i always like to ask everybody what their why is given given the name of the show i know you, you mentioned family um i don't know if there's you want to expand there uh you know, I'm, I'm a pretty simple guy, Jason. I, I am. I don't, I don't have a vision board that's got a big yacht, although we've got a, we've got boats and we, we spend a lot of time in the water. For me, it's all about lifestyle. Like we, I really enjoy, um, you know, spending time with the family, but I, I like sharing experiences together with them. So we, we do a lot of uh, traveling together, spend a lot of time on the ocean together, whether it be fishing or recreationally, but like bottom line is we're together and we've got the flexibility to be together and, and, you know, just do things that, um, ultimately I, again, it's all relative. I didn't, I had a great childhood and upbringing, but like that, that was not an option back then. And, and I know life is short. I mean, we're at the age now, I don't know how old you are, Jason, but I mean, I'm 43 and, you know, unfortunately at this age, you start knowing people may not immediate friends. Like you start knowing people that have health ailments that just come out of nowhere and, and, and their life's cut short. And so for me, it's like, how do I figure out a way with, with 
all my investment activities and the things that I do in the day to day in order to buy more time with my family and 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 live these days and these moments together and and create these experiences again because again you I, I believe based on your background you've got children man it yeah. goes so fast I know that all of our yeah, parents told crazy. us that all the time right like they always like tried to hammer <laughs> yeah. that in your head like hey yeah. don't you know, don't blink because like they'll be you know in yeah. high school before you know it, and no shit like that is the truth. Uh, you know, I've got a six, nine year old and the nine year old, like kids almost becoming independent. Like he doesn't need help with anything anymore. In fact, I tried to help with his homework the other night and I, I struggled with it. Yeah. <laughs> like, man, yeah, it's, uh... you know, so anyway, just, uh, <laughs> totally it's, it's really, it's really the time and flexibility, um, to, to, to create these memories with the family. That, that literally is it. And, and I'm, you know, I don't have fancy cars. We've got nice vehicles and a nice home. We love the neighbor we live in. And, uh, for me, it's the family. So again, yeah. not to be simplistic in nature, but that is by far my why and the most important thing to me. I'm I'm in the same boat. I'm I'm older than you. I'm 47, but my kids are younger. Had them, I guess, a late whatever you want, whatever the right amount of, whatever the rule is for when you have kids. I guess I have kids a little bit late. They're they're three and one, so they're young. But yeah, it's it goes by very fast. I mean, just yeah. even in this short time, it's like seeing the the difference between my son and my daughter, and like what what he's doing already at, at three and a half is just I'm like oh man he literally like it's going to be high school call it like before we know it everything's going to go by so yeah no I'm, I'm totally with you on that it, it's about being able to spend time with them um uh second question for you Kevin tell us something about yourself that that maybe isn't common knowledge uh special skill or a hobby something that you know maybe people don't know about you very well I don't know if I have any special skills, but, uh, you know, one, one of my hobbies is, uh, I love cycling. So, you know, road cycling on a, on a bicycle and, uh, um, maybe something I, I probably talked about a long time ago, but I, 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 I don't share all that often is that, um, I did kind of an extreme cycling event back when I started, you know, I guess about 12 years ago where I jumped on my bike, got a, got a kind of wild hair at my butt and, uh, had just gotten married, didn't have kids yet. And, I was in a challenging time in my life. I, I, 2008 happened. Uh, there was a number of years that flowed after that, that were just very, very tough. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah. And, um, it needed something. I needed a, a physical goal or t challenge or task that I, that, that I, I need to push myself. I need to get out of my comfort zone because I it just, things weren't going well. And so I decided to ride my bike by myself with not too much planning or training from Florida all the way up to Washington, DC. And, uh, and I trained for about three weeks to do it. Got on a couple forums, asked questions. Um, one of my close friends that I respected highly told me that I was crazy, that I wouldn't be able to finish it. And that ultimately gave me more fuel to do it. And, <laughs> right, and, right. uh, and I finished it. Um, very challenging. Wanted to quit many times. Tried to quit one time. Um, that, that didn't pan out all that well. And, um, and ultimately rode my bike 1154 miles over 11 days by myself with one pair of clothes. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, that's impressive yeah that's impressive. yeah yeah, that, yeah that's the stuff that you do before you have kids and then yeah yep, yep, and yep, then yep. maybe when they get old enough to want to do those crazy things with you but yeah, yeah. it's a it's a uh that's pretty cool um when people hear this and they want to reach out to you what's the best way to find you yeah, you can find me on my website uh kevinbup.com there you can also listen to to my podcast uh that i that i do on a weekly basis um and then also, if you want to learn about what we're doing in the investment world, you can go to investwithsunrise.com. And there you can learn about parking lot investments, mobile home park investments, and everything else we do there at Sunrise. Okay, very cool. Uh, final question for you. What is a piece of advice you would give to someone who is just getting started, trying to trying to get in that you know sort of real estate space? What, what would you tell them? You know, I think we hit on a good bit in the beginning about just mentors. And, you know, I think nowadays, I think it's way easier, at least than what it was probably back when I got started 20 years ago, um, as far as like investment club meetings, meetup groups, lots of virtual events. I mean, there isn't a day that goes by where I don't see it. There's some type of conference coming this following, you know, this coming weekend, a multifamily conference, commercial real estate, what have you. And so I'd say just, you need to get entrenched in it and get involved. I mean, um, the people out there that are already doing what you're doing, uh, that you want to be doing, they're there. And actually they're there. They're, you can find out exactly where they're going to be, right. By, by going to these yeah. events, right. You can be there around them and, and rub shoulders with them. And so I think it's just putting a lot of time, energy and effort into networking and getting to know people again, getting to know them, not, not just who they are, but like, how can you bring value to them and their business and, 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 and just get around them more often so that just through osmosis, you can start really getting a good handle on the business. But uh, again, I think it's way easier nowadays. Um, 
uh, than what it was 20 years ago with technology. And so leverage technology, use it to your benefit and um, um, just dive in both feet all, all at one time. Just get in there. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's great advice. I, I think that's uh, just, there literally is a con it's I see it all the time it's like <laughs> come to this conference that's coming up it's like well there's three others conferences at that same time so it, it's uh it's it's very uh very competitive I guess any uh, you know one other thing which I think a lot of people have found success in and and you know I don't know whether it's the right path or not you have to figure that out for yourself but um I've seen you know, a lot of folks do like localized uh you know multi-family meetups and like I've seen some that have actually been put on by people and they don't they don't try to lie about their experience level or mislead you but they might not be the ones that are experienced but ultimately they're bringing guest speakers in or they're right. you know they're bringing people in to speak on particular topics but they're the facilitator they're the moderator they're the ones that actually put it together it's really simple to put together a meetup it costs very little money you know find a location on a monthly basis and uh and now you know become maybe that thought leader of that particular group and inevitably you're going to find yourself whether you like it or not rubbing elbows with other people that are doing that you know what you want to do so I think many different ways that you can skin that cap, but just, I'd say, take action now and uh, start doing something. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. I think that's a uh, fantastic advice. Um, well, with that, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on and, and uh, sharing all of your wisdom and taking the time out today. I really appreciate it. Oh, Jason, thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun being here, my friend. Awesome. Awesome. Um, people listening, if you like this episode, please like rate and review so we can get more uh, fantastic guests like Kevin on here. All right, have a great day. I'd like to show you why knowing your why is the start of your journey. Without a strong why, it can be so difficult to reach your maximum potential. My name is Dr. Jason Ballara, and every week I meet with real estate investors and mindset specialists that are taking action in order to build a life according to their own terms. We will break down what drives successful people and allows them to achieve at such a high level. If you are a professional wanting to break through, or simply someone that wants to hear an inspiring story, the Know Your Why podcast is made for you.